Inshallah, we're going to discuss the lesson China limits European contacts. And let me remind you that this title is the one or the title that was in the previous book, okay? The reason I kept the title from the previous book plus also I am going to discuss the new title is that I have a point of view and I would like to hear from you as well. The new title in the new book with the almost same kind of information is China rejects expansion, okay? So we can tell that some people would see a certain movement as an expansion and another group of people or someone else would see the same idea or the same movement as like interfering or uh, connecting to uh, another place or idea. So China limits European contacts. Let me remind you that the previous lesson was about the age of exploration. This is still the age of exploration, uh, end of the 14th century, where Europe and European countries started to explore the world, right? With, of course, the motives and the reasons that facilitated this exploration or expansion. They were able to reach Asia, they were able to reach Africa, and now we're discussing uh, this uh, place, which is China, Japan, and other places as well, okay? So one more time, China limits European contacts, or China rejects expansion, and here we mean the European expansion. Before we start, you need to be sure of the objectives. What do you need to do or know at the end of this lesson? Number one, you need to identify the successors of the early Ming emperors. So this would just click an idea, okay, of uh, discussing the Ming dynasty. Then number two, you need to describe China and Korea under the Qing dynasty, another family, royal family. Describe life in the Ming and Qing. The main idea here is that the Ming and the Qing dynasties made advances in China during that period of time. So we're mainly discussing two royal families that governed China during, during the period of expansion, European expansion or European uh, exploration. So while Europeans were exploring or uh, expanding, there were two, during that period of time, there were two royal families governing. Of course, uh, I will tell you which one was first. During this period of time, we have two royal families in China, okay? It's very important to know about that because those royal families made a lot of advances which led China uninterested in European contacts. During that period of time, Whenever Europeans visited any country, they just uh, had a motive for that. Maybe they wanted to spread Christianity, they wanted to uh, trade spices, they wanted other things, and if you remember motives, the motives for God, glory, and gold. <coughs> Let's start here with the Ming Dynasty, okay? One more time, we're talking about China during the late or the end of the 14th century, okay? What was happening in China? We have somebody who's called Honghua, okay? Honghua was the founder of the first royal family in China. This royal family was called the Ming Dynasty. Let me connect or relate to other empires that we've studied before, okay? In order to start an empire, you have to have a leader. So if you remember the Ottoman Empire, we have Osman, the founder. The Mughal Empire, we have Babur, the founder. Now here, the Ming Dynasty, or the Chinese Empire, this one, we have Honghua, okay? So you need to know that also there was a period of chaos. And then we have the Mongol groups in Mongolia broke away. Chinese groups wanted their own dynasty. What happened here is that we have somebody called Honghua, and he united the country and set up his capital 
in southern China. And then he founded the Ming dynasty. Ming means brilliant, brilliant, smart. Let's connect. Do we have any uh, empire or dynasty or an emperor who called himself uh, something to refer to his uh, achievements or what he wants to achieve? Yes, we have Akbar, okay. He called himself, we have Akbar, he was uh, Galal al-Din, he called himself Akbar, and then we have Shah Jahan, also he called himself, Jahangir, he called himself the grasper of the world, and here we have Hongwa called his royal family, the Ming, okay? Uh, he was, by the way, a military emperor, and uh, being a military emperor would enable any leader to found a strong empire. He brought order back. He trusted no one and killed anyone suspected of treason, and he ruled for 30 years. During those 30 years of the Chinese empire, China was very strong. He made a lot of achievements and advances in China. One of the achievements or the accomplishments that would prove how China was so strong and powerful was the voyages of exploration, the Chinese voyages of exploration. Those voyages, was, uh, those voyages were done or were made by Zheng He who was a Chinese Muslim admiral. As I told you, China, during those 30, 30 years, were very strong because of Hongwa, okay? So we have this Chinese Muslim admiral, a high rank in the Navy named Zheng He, or as they call it, Zheng Ha, led all the seven voyages. He led seven voyages. Okay, those seven voyages were diplomatic and military and trading ventures. And I need you to be able to compare those voyages, the Chinese voyages, to the European voyages. Europeans wanted to explore the world for reasons. And the Chinese also wanted to explore the world for reasons. The reasons for the Europeans were for God, glory, and gold. Here, we have other reasons that we are going to discuss. Also, I want you to pay attention to the size of the voyages. If you remember when we discussed how Europeans explored the world, they started only with one ship. Prince Henry was the first one to um, start the exploration from Portugal to uh, Ceuta in Morocco with only a few people on a ship uh, going to the place and uh, going back after making a lot of uh, improvements to the ship, right? You remember that? Here, we have not only one ship, we have not only seven voyages, and we have a full expedition with many ships, many people, huge, yes, yes. So, however, the main purpose was to promote the glory of the Qing dynasty. That was the main reason. The main reason was to promote the glory of the Ming dynasty. They wanted to show the world how glorious they were. They wanted to share their advances, okay? Those expeditions were remarkable for their size. As I told you, fleet size, ship measurements, and also the distance traveled. The voyages ranged from southeast to eastern Africa. And we have like almost 40 to 300 ships, which included fighting ships, storage vessels, and treasure ships. The fleet's crew numbered over 27,000, including sailors, soldiers, carpenters, accountants, doctors, as if it was a huge floating city. One more time, I want you to visualize 
how Europeans started exploration and how the Chinese started their exploration. Both exploration or both voyages of exploration happened during almost the same period of time. Okay? Everywhere the Chinese went, they dis distributed gifts. They gave gifts such as silver and silk. And that was a way of showing Chinese superiority. One more time, the main motive of the Chinese exploration was to show how superior they were, how glorious they were. Of course, as a result, more than 16 countries sent tribute or gifts to show gratitude to the Ming court. However, Chinese scholar officials complained that those voyages wasted valuable resources. Huge amounts of money were spent on building the ships and uh, providing those ships with all the food and the material and the medicine and the resources and everything needed for those um, voyages. And after the seventh voyage in 1433, Chinese withdraw into isolation. After those voyages, the Chinese people started to have a new point of view or a new opinion of stopping the exploration and starting the isolation. So far, so good. 